Okay, so our next talk is from the wonderful Dr. Esther Murray, who stood beside me. Um, I'll let her introduce herself, because I did get it wrong once before. Um, but the talk that we're going to listen to now is Moral Injury and Psychological Safety in the Pre-Hospital Practice. Hi everybody, it's such a pleasure to be here this afternoon and thank you so much for inviting me to, to Grace and to Matt because when, we first, well, when I first heard about Fem Feedback, so as an educator and a psychologist I was so, so excited. I think this initiative is exactly what is needed. I'm so impressed with the way it's all been organised with so much thought and care and I think it's going to be incredibly useful. I'm very pleased that psychology is getting such a, a, a lot of name checking um, this afternoon. So great. So, John, I'm not kidding about that cognitive bias lecture. If you could just come and do that for me, I'd be really grateful. So, I want to talk to you now about the topic of my research, which some of you might know about already moral injury. But I'm also going to talk to you about some of the psychological uh, features, shall I say, of our makeup, uh, which might help this process. So, these are things that we might be able to tap into that aren't necessarily terribly easy to live with all the time, but they might make life easier for us if we know more about them, okay? So I do just want to orientate you to um, the story so far, as so I think that's quite important. I started talking to audiences in pre-hospital care about moral injury in the summer of 2016, having undertaken some research with students, and I'm going to talk to you a bit about that. And what was really extraordinary was that so many people then wanted to talk to me about it some more. So since then, I've spent a significant proportion of my time traveling around the country, <coughs> talking to people. Um, I talk to people in theaters. I do stuff around well-being in theaters with uh, all the theater staff. I've met with counter-terrorism officers in the police force, and we've talked about well-being and moral injury. Um, I've talk to intensive care, the Intensive Care Society, so I don't just do stuff in pre-hospital care. What's been amazing is learning about how you will work with one another. I'm not a clinician, I'm a health psychologist, and we do a different kind of job entirely, focus a lot on behaviour change. So I've had a really exciting couple of years learning so much about what you do, and I feel like coming here today to be able to talk about how this applies to something like Fem Feedback is a really nice moment for me. So, moral injury. So, I first started reading about this um, when I was reading about some work uh, with military veterans and worked pretty hard to think about how it can apply in medicine. I'm pretty confident that it does apply in medicine. I think it's a really good way of describing the psychological harm that results from the exposure to events which threaten or compromise our view of the world. So, a lot of the jobs that you might see pre-hospitally have to do with where people have hurt one another, interpersonal violence, um, domestic violence, for example, lots of suicide and crime, and of course, terrible accidents, but sometimes those accidents, like road traffic accidents, coming around um, as a result of the neglect or, or carelessness on the part of some people, perhaps through drugs or alcohol. So there's quite a lot in that which is difficult to take on board and difficult to feel okay about. Um, so it results in, in uh, symptoms which are not dissimilar, I suppose, to other forms of psychological distress, which have to do with feeling socially isolated and what we call intrusive re-experiencing or rumination. So you'll know a bit about bandwidth, you know, you only have so much bandwidth or cognitive space available to you at any one time. So when we're worrying about something or we've been very upset by something and we mull it over, it means that we have less space to do our other thinking. So that's problematic, as you can imagine. Um, what moral injury also does to people is it makes them feel guilty. They feel guilty that they couldn't do more. They feel guilty that they see people living in, for example, terrible poverty or in terrible situations or having hurt one another and that the world is like that. And when we feel guilty, we often feel ashamed and we don't want to tell other people. So it's a deeply personal process. And I think that what I'm excited about with Fem Feedback is maybe it'll give another space to have the kinds of conversations about what makes certain jobs difficult that allow people to talk about these kinds of, of hurts that are to do with, we had an idea of how the world was and then it suddenly wasn't like that anymore, okay? So 
Sadly, we know that um, <coughs> symptoms of PTSD, depression, anxiety are really prevalent in ambulance workers. Um, MIND does a lot of work on this now and they keep up their work. Um, they're also doing work in emergency departments. So we know that this is a really stressful job. Um, we don't know very much about the long term, what we do in the ambulance service, but in other areas of emergency medicine, pre-hospital care, we don't really know what's happening to people in the long term. And I suppose a bit of my professional background is important here because as a health psychologist, I am most interested in function. I just want stuff to work, okay? So of all the branches of psychology, we're much more over to the positive psychology side. We're very keen to see people functioning optimally and doing whatever they need to do to make it work for them. So I would like to see everybody being able to do these jobs for as long as they want to and in as healthy a way as possible. I don't like seeing that jobs like this are causing people to burn out. And we also know that people don't always end up with a diagnosable disorder. So distress and upset is a normal part of human life. That's fine, and nobody needs to be treated for that, if you like. But what we do need are spaces in which we can talk about things. So thinking about why these sorts of things happen, so getting deep into the psychology again, we wonder if... It's to do with the way we process information. So there's a way that you can process information <coughs> that doesn't involve your emotions. You can do a kind of head version, not a head and heart version. So even when we debrief cases and we do a clinical debrief, um, it tends to be very facts-based. You don't talk necessarily terribly much about feelings um, for all kinds of reasons. But the thing is, if you don't talk about how stuff feels, you can't let it go. I saw a great tweet just earlier about the, the head, um, I won't get it correct, but it was something about that people keep thinking about stuff that the heart can't let go of. All right, so there's that. There's this emotional processing that needs to happen. And, and that doesn't really mean crying and breaking down. I don't mean that. I mean having the opportunity to have a bit of a difficult conversation. We're also, as humans, great fans of making meaning of things. We like stuff to make sense. And I think having lots of clinicians in the room, you know yourselves, you like stuff to make sense. You want to be able to apply the algorithm for the algorithm to work. Yeah? So this is why we end up with cognitive biases coming in, because we busy up our sense making before we've actually looked at the whole picture. So we really want stuff to make sense. But what about when it doesn't make sense and people just do dreadful things? Um, we also might get stuck in our cognitive processing so that a good example of this is a um, young chap a trainee was telling me that the, the first time he ever did CPR on a real person and not on a mannequin really stayed with him because of the sounds that the man made and he didn't know that was going to happen. And these are the sorts of sensory details that stick sometimes and we can't get rid of them and because we're focusing on those we don't see the wider picture. So the implications, so you all work in teams, all right? Well, almost all of you, I know some paramedics go out on their own, but teamwork is in extremely important to make this type of medicine work. So if you're socially withdrawn, you can't function effectively in a team. If you're busy worrying about something that's happened, you won't be listening to your teammates, you won't be able to process new information effectively. And obviously, if people stay like that for long enough and their team can't look after them, then they're going to burn out and maybe be using substances to change their state because we use substances all the time to change the way we feel. That's a really usual thing for humans to do, whether it's coffee, sugar, but of course there are substances that we can use, including alcohol and including sugar, in fact, that are actually pretty harmful to us. So I started talking to the students about this because they were doing pre-hospital care, um, they were part of the pre-hospital care program or they were doing the IBSC in pre-hospital medicine. And I want you to hear a bit about what they said because I think it's useful for the students in the room but also for the teachers in the room, for all the managers and all of those, who are those of us who are guiding people. So they talk about the little things. So they talk about the little things, and these are what I mean by these cognitive or sensory details that stay with people. And they felt shy to talk about these little things, what they call the little things. 
And I think all of us reading this, we can completely have compassion for how that could upset someone. But the students were very shy to talk about it to their seniors because they felt that it wasn't important enough. This is what they say about debrief. In order for you to do it, to talk, you have to accept that something stressed you out or affected you. And for me, that was quite a big step. So if we get FEM feedback working all the time, it stops being a big step and it starts being a much more usual thing. Some of them wanted to talk at the time. Some of them wanted to talk um, at different times as well. And this is really important also that debrief sometimes needs to come later. Sometimes in the immediate, it's not so much of a problem, but maybe two and three and four and five weeks down the line, or even more time down the line, they still need to speak. So they were enjoying also the opportunity to write things down, but they knew that they needed to get things out. I want you to see this next slide because it tells you something about how they see their seniors. And I know that other sort of senior clinicians I've shown this to were quite surprised by it. So this last slide, I think it's easier for them, the experienced doctors, to deal with these cases because they have a lot more medical knowledge. They're prepared for it. They look at the scenes with medical eyes and they've got their algorithms. Now, I don't know how you more senior folk in the room experience that and whether you think you're protected by your experience. But what this means is it's difficult for trainees to talk to their seniors because they believe that people more senior to them are having a different type of experience. And it's useful to know this so that we can help people speak to us and let them know that those who are more senior might get just as sad or just as troubled and that different things trouble different people and it doesn't have to be the big jobs it can be lots of little jobs or very particular things that remind you there's one last slide i want you to show i want to show you sorry <laughs> that's from the students where she says this so she's done her ibsc in pre-hospital medicine and she said i've worried that this year has exposed me psychologically to a bit too much, a bit too soon in my career. But I haven't gone through my career yet, so I don't know whether it's going to make me better. And if I have this really early on exposure to trauma and say, ooh, it's been really rubbish, how can I make it better for myself? Will it help me in the long run? Or is it the earlier you get exposed to this stuff, the earlier you burn out? I think it's really important that we have perspectives from students to think about so that we know the concerns that they have about their own mental health because we're talking so much about psychological well-being and mental health issues in emergency medicine and hospital care and it's really important that we focus on their voices to help maybe allay some fears maybe look at things people can put in place to look after themselves now i'm going to talk to you about some of the psychological uh i don't know tools gifts something that we have that might help us and the first of these is detachment. You need to be able to detach yourselves from the emotion of the situation in order to do the job. Because you guys run towards things that other people run away from. And that is a usual thing. And I have heard, had people speak to me and say, but I, I'm worried, so I don't know how I do it, that I go from one job to the next, to the next, to the next, and I'm all right. But that is a usual thing, and that is what detachment is for. The worry comes if you find that you can't let the feelings come back in when you're then not on shift, all right? So maybe you're doing something that you ought maybe to enjoy, like being with friends or family or going for a run, whatever it is. So the concern might come when the detachment feeling doesn't go away. Cognitive appraisal, so Shakespeare has to show up in all my talks pretty much. So we think about things. Humans are sense-making animals and we think about stuff and we wonder about it. And that is also a usual thing. And we want to think about what we feel about it and we want to think about what we did. And the systems that you have in your jobs also set you up to do this, don't they? Because you review what happened and even just talking about firm feedback at all, we're talking about reviewing what happened. It's a part of coping. We have lots of coping mechanisms available to us and we have um, and this is just one of them, this sense-making, trying to put a story together. However, we also have this. 
Sadly, talking of biases, humans have this thing called a negativity bias. So we suspect that it brings some evolutionary benefit. Personally, I think I could do without, but there it is. So we have this negativity bias. It's really useful for learning, but it feels awful. So we're really more likely to remember the less good stuff than the good stuff. So if you ever have that happening to you, know that it isn't you. It's your brain, and it's just trying to do helpful things. Um, it's useful in pre-hospital medicine. It's really useful, but it is important to be mindful of it. And sometimes it's worth using some exercises to be able to maybe put it aside, OK? It's important to know what went well and what went wrong and what you could do better next time. And it's important to be kind to yourselves and compassionate <coughs> towards yourselves, to know that sometimes brains are really great at giving us lots of information that we don't need. So I talked earlier about rumination and how much our, our brains go merrily, merrily on when we don't need them to, especially in the middle of the night, I find, or just as you're laying your head down to go to sleep. It's particularly exciting brain time. It is fine to tell it to shut up. In fact, in, in CBT, if you go for CBT, they literally teach you to do that. So you're still learning. You're still a learning, engaged, reflective person. If you say to your brain, time now. It's time to stop now. We did this in debrief, or I did this with my debriefer when I got my feedback, all these kinds of things, but now I need to sleep, okay? So just know that this is how your mind works. It will naturally detach you from troubling things in order to get you through it. It will naturally want to make sense of all the things that you see, even when there's no sense to be made, and it will naturally keep reminding you of what went wrong. And it's up to you to keep it in its place. And you can do this. But that's, I think, another lecture for another day. But it's worth thinking about growth. I think the really exciting thing about FEM feedback is it gives lots and lots of opportunities for growth. So you'll have heard of post-traumatic growth, right? Um, I don't talk too much about PTSD and things all the time. But, but we know that both individuals and groups can grow and improve or live better lives after negative and traumatic situations. We have the evidence of that sitting right here in this audience. Um, so tapping into your values in relation to work can be really, really useful. And that's as simple as knowing why you do it. Just checking in with yourself. So while your brain would like something to do, why don't you give it this to do? Why don't you ask it? Why am I here? Why this job and not any other? What is it that I do? So Jonathan talked so powerfully earlier, didn't he, about what it meant to him to have helped Gordon so much and how that stays with him. And it's something he can lean on every day. So this is the sort of thing I'm, I'm talking about. You don't have to save someone's life. You just have to know why you're there. And what that helps you do is stay in the job and stay healthy. And I think that could be a really, really part, useful part of your feedback conversations. Okay, so that's me done. Please do get in touch. <laughs>